Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 733 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 20th of January 2024 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Alex Carver about why she chooses to go direct after several decades in the publishing industry, mindset and merchandise. Alex kindly sent me a box of the merchandise she sells from her store so I could have a look and we talk about all the different things, how she sourced them and lessons learned, as well as the challenges of selling direct and why she wouldn't have it any other way. And she also only publishes one book a year. So the launch is very important. And we talk about various aspects of doing merchandise that are more sustainable, which I think is great. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing things, uh, crossover with AI again, as as these two worlds collide, The Telegraph reported this week that an award-winning Japanese writer, Ri Kudan, used ChatGPT to write parts of her prize-winning novel. She estimates about 5% was taken verbatim from the chatbot. One of the judges lauded the work as flawless. Re added that she often confides in the programme with thoughts she can never talk to anyone else about, and some of the responses inspired dialogue in the book. So I wanted to mention this because I think it's awesome that she has, it's just completely open about this, that she's won this award. It's a literary award, so this is very good writing. So there's a few things. First of all, she said she used 5% verbatim, as in just copying and pasting. Now, as someone who uses chat and Claude quite a lot, uh, it makes me think that she used it for the whole draft, but she rewrote the rest. So even if she only did 5% verbatim, how much of the first draft was written? And again, there's no problem with that. Uh, For Catacomb, the last novel I used it for, and also my short story, Beneath the Zoo, Chat wrote quite a lot of the scenes in first draft. I did all the prompting, I did all the beats, and then we wrote it together. And then I rewrote pretty much every single sentence. Now, some people might say, oh, that's a really convoluted process, but that really helps me as there's no blank page. I much prefer editing to first drafting. Some people love first drafting and hate editing. I'm the other way around. It makes me think that this is the process she may be used. Um, And of course, it's the amount of human involved that makes it your book and your copyright. And it sounds like she is an AI assisted artisan author and that she's like she says, she's talking, she's confiding in the program with thoughts she can't talk to anyone else about. And I've heard this from a lot of people. I do it myself. Um, I know Jonathan does this is talking to chat because you can do it with voice now, uh, talking about things that you you're thinking about and it just it just really helps so (laughs) I thought this was great that she was just completely open and honest and won an award and uh yeah just really open about it also the judges described the work as flawless which means the writing is excellent and it made me think you know some people still say oh it's really crap it does really crap writing (laughs) but we are at the point now with gpt4 the paid version of chat and also with claude.ai if you can't get good writing out of it then the problem is your prompts and your ideas that is the problem and your use of the tool is what makes it not great so if you are wanting to do this you do have to spend some time learning this is not a this is still a tool right so you have to learn to use it in the way that uh, helps you get the best creative output for whatever you want to use it for Uh, Also, Sam Altman just mentioned at the World Economic Forum that more functionality is coming in 2024. Some people are saying that's 4.5. Some people are saying maybe it's GPT-5. But whatever it is, there's going to be further developments this year. So, uh, and obviously with, well, I say obviously, you might not have heard, but Meta is going all in in open source AI, which means all of this stuff is going to accelerate even more this year. Again, we don't let that scare us. We are surfing the wave of change, creatives. Uh, We're not going to drown in it. We're going to surf the wave. And that's why I keep talking about it is you, if, if you're 
at least starting to paddle. <laughs> Because remember, when you surf, you have to paddle into the wave, right? You have to speed up so you can catch it. So you're at the same uh, speed, even though I'm not a surfer, I know that much. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to sort of paddle and make sure we can keep up. Also, what was interesting, this writer is in her early 30s and is open and positive about her use of AI. I also have uh, chatted with some people in their 20s about this and they are just generally using the tools. And uh, I think I mentioned this uh, last year, but it was kind of I was appalled that this uh, young person, who I guess is half my age, uh, said to me, oh, that's so great that you're trying to use these tools. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, condescending much. <laughs> but it was funny because I think I'm pretty forward thinking in these things, but they saw it as a surprise that an older person would be up to date on all this stuff. So yes, um, these younger people, people in their 30s, 20s, people at school who are using these tools, they're going to usher this in anyway. And I don't want to be the old guard. I want to keep reinventing myself and my creative and business processes as the technology changes. And again, remember to think of this as similar to the internet. If this is the early days of the internet, um, when things were just starting out in the next two decades, it's going to advance into a new ecosystem. So yeah, interesting times. That is, uh, I'll put the link in the show notes to that. That was reported in the Telegraph, but also in a lot of other places. So in my personal news this week, I'm in the final self-edit of my completely rewritten author blueprint. And it is essentially now a new short non-fiction book. It's about 27,000 words. And uh, this is this has been a much bigger project than I expected it to be. It's always that way, isn't it? But it was definitely about time. Uh, it's going to be, there will be segments on, as there is in the one right now, but there'll be segments on writing, publishing, marketing, and business and AI. So there'll be kind of five sections in the book it's almost like a I don't want to say a manifesto it's more I guess my position about a lot of these different things and hopefully with lots of helpful links and yeah so anyway I'm getting a cover design I'm getting it edited I'm treating it like a, a non-fiction book it will be free to people on my email list thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint uh, as an ebook and uh, I wasn't going to do a print edition I certainly won't be publishing it elsewhere but there will probably be a print edition on my store because as I was going through it I was like I think some people might want this in print it's it's quite a useful little book if I do say so myself. <laughs> so yeah, there we go. The ebook will be free for sure. So I have also been doing cleanup on the Creative Pen as part of my pivot, essentially removing a lot of backlist posts and pages from my site, uh, things that are out of date, things I don't particularly want to be known for anymore. And eventually I'll be replacing content or adding new content around things I do want to be known for, like writing the shadow, uh, for example, um, that kind of thing. What was funny, and I thought I'd bring this up because I came across a whole load of things that made me laugh, a few that made me sigh, a, a few that made me sad. So I thought I would uh, mention them. First, th this is one of these sort of bingo, to, to get out your bingo card if you've been around a, a while in self-publishing world, in the indie world. Okay, so how many of these <laughs> do you remember? The Vook. <laughs> yes, that was a video book back in the day. The Vook. The Espresso Book Machine. I know Mark Leslie Lefebvre will remember that one, but I thought that was the future. <laughs> Podio Books, you might remember them. Stumble Upon. Now, I actually used to really enjoy Stumble Upon. It was like a, a thing where you pressed a button and it would surface something new from the internet. Book Track. I know a few of you will remember Book Track. And then Google Plus. <laughs> remember Google Plus. I really thought Google Plus was going to be a great thing, but it, it didn't work. And then the word blogosphere, blogosphere, no one says that anymore. But my early blog posts were full of blogosphere, uh, which was interesting. Pronoun self-publishing. Some of you might remember that, which sold to Macmillan. And I had forgotten about that one and just shows you how many tools and services come and go. I, I, those are just literally some of the things that I found in some of those backlist articles. I also found an article that I wrote in 2015 about virtual reality headsets and glasses and the future of publishing. And considering Apple is about to launch their first headset uh, next month, I was probably a decade early. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm usually five years early, but this, this was definitely a decade early. Also, my language around social has changed. Early on, it was social networking. Then it switched to social media. And now it's social commerce. So that's really interesting too. Some people have died. Dan Pointer and Joel Friedlander, I particularly wanted to mention as uh, two people who made a huge difference to the uh, early days of being an indie author. And a whole load more people who I've talked to who have disappeared from the internet. Maybe more people have died, but many are not writing anymore. I also found a blog post from 2009 about the shadow. And that's really interesting. It was interesting to me. It was about five things you can learn from Carl Jung. It included the collective unconscious, the Jungian archetypes and the shadow. And yes, it just demonstrates how long I've been thinking in public, I guess, about these topics. And writing the shadow was the culmination of that. I also wanted to clarify, because I've had a few emails from people, my 15-year pivot to focus on J.F. Penn is not a pivot to fiction. So I know that J.F. Penn has primarily done fiction in the past, but my travel memoir, Pilgrimage, is under J.F. Penn. There will be more non-fiction under that name. So the Gothic cathedrals will be under J.F. Penn, and that is non-fiction. I also have future books in mind, definitely one on Memento Mori, um, graveyards, catacombs and crypts. Uh, These might be separate books, who knows. I also have ideas for one on curiosity and so many more as well as novels and short stories. So I'm probably more likely to shift to one non-fiction, one fiction a year or something like that and a a short story or two. That's that's probably the way I'm going. Um, So JF Penn is more a holistic creative focus, not just about fiction. And this is important to mention uh, because I... I'm not someone who wants to make a living just with my fiction. So I wanted to clear that up. I think it's also a difficult living to just have fiction. I've always had nonfiction. So, and I like writing nonfiction. I also feel that it is less disruptable because certainly the type of nonfiction I'm planning to write, more like pilgrimage, is going to be very personal. So yeah, I just wanted to clarify that um, just to make sure you're not confused about my plans. Also on Pivots, I did an interview with Don King on his Alignment show and we talked about my backstory and the pivot and also some things I haven't talked about before. Uh, Plus it's a rare video so you can find that on the Alignment show, links in the show notes. So thanks for your emails and comments this week and lots of photos which was great because I love to see real people instead of just download numbers. Taryn sent a photo from a cruise ship in the middle of the Pacific. Um, This was my first overseas trip since the pandemic. Comforting to have your familiar voice in my ear. Thanks to Rosie, who sent a picture walking along the Wellington waterfront in the dark. Uh, I love the positive forward thinking approach. I'm learning a lot, which is great. Chrysalyn said, I'm a teenage indie author who discovered your podcast a couple of months ago. I listen to it almost every day because there's such a huge backlist. And th- this slightly concerns me uh, because Chrysalyn is, uh, I think, 16, I think, from the email. So <laughs> since this podcast has been going almost as long as you've been alive, Chrysalyn, please don't listen to anything that's too too far back. <laughs> The world has certainly changed. I think the craft stuff is evergreen, but a lot of the business stuff is certainly not. And Chrysalyn listens while doing diamond dots, which I'd never heard of too, which is pretty cool. Anna Maria sent a photo after I shared about my lifting. Anna Maria sent a photo of her mum winning a master's trophy for her deadlift in 2016 at the age of 73. And that's awesome. I just love that. And then just uh, there were lots more emails this week, which I really appreciate and comments on the blog and everything. Just wanted to mention Tiffany, who said on the interview with Barbara, writing to discover is exactly how I write. The story tells me how it wants to be told and I write it. I've tried plotting, but once I begin, my characters and story always rebel against my carefully laid plans. Hearing that you and Barbara write similarly was so encouraging. (laughs) Also, my six-year-old popped in when he heard your show starting and said pen with a double n (laughs) i love that i'm just spreading this across the world awesome 
Right, lots more emails. Thank you to everyone. I do really love to hear from you. You can leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me. Send me pictures of where you're listening, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. But please don't message me on social media as I am pretty much almost off it. Right, today's show is sponsored by Drafter Digital, self-publishing with support. And this is actually one of the very good reasons you might choose to publish through Drafter Digital. They have a customer service team who can help you, and sometimes that's just what you need. You can publish ebooks to all the big platforms as well as library systems. You can also publish print books and they can help you through that process too. They have free formatting tools as well as an easy publishing system. I use Drafter Digital for my ebook distribution to Nook, library systems, and now even to Apple. And I also use their excellent payment splitting for my co written book, The Relaxed Author, with Mark Leslie Lefebvre, a great option if you are co writing. There are no charges for formatting or updating your book. They take a distributor 10% of retail price on sale. No upsells, no service packages, no fees of any kind. Set your price to whatever you want, even free. Make as many changes as you want to your book. Update the cover. Distribute it to any and every sales channel you want. It's your book, your choice, your world. They also have marketing tools and promotional opportunities available. As Drafter Digital says, your book is your priority. Our priority is you. We build tools and services that let you focus on writing while we take care of layout, publishing, distribution, print on demand, paperbacks and more. Check them out at draft2digital.com. That's with a number two, draft2digital.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my community at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to the 18 new patrons who've joined this week. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting for months and years. Now this week in the patron area, I put out a step-by-step video on how I made my book trailer for Beneath the Zoo with Dali in ChatGPT and also with Canva which members are finding super useful. And I share all my prompts and the iterations and how I did that, how I found the music, how I put it together and all of that. So if you want to make a book trailer, it is now far more possible. (laughs) So if you join the community, you get that and all the backlist videos and audio, which also include tutorials on things like Claude and ChatGPT, as well as access to the monthly Q&A, which I'll be doing this week, which is an extra solo show a month. The Patreon is now a monthly subscription, the equivalent to a black coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. If you get value from this show and you want more, come on over and join more than 980 authors now uh, behind the scenes. Thanks to all the patrons. You are fantastic. I'm so glad you find the show useful after all this time. Join us at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. And there is a Patreon app so you can watch the videos or listen through the app if that's easiest. Right, let's get into the interview. Alex Carver is the multi-award winning New York Times and USA Today best-selling thriller author of the FBI profiler Maggie O'Dell series and K-9 handler Ryder Creed series, amongst other books. So welcome to the show, Alex. Oh, thanks, Joe. I'm, I'm so excited and thank you for inviting me. Oh, yes. Well, we have lots to talk about. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and self-publishing. Well, I've been in the business now for over 20 years. So I guess as a kid, I was like all the other authors. But I but for me, I never dreamed that you could actually make a living by writing up stories and writing books. Both my parents were children of Polish immigrants, and they instilled a very strong work ethic. But I went to college on an art scholarship. And at 26, I started my own graphic design company. I was designing anything from corporate brochures to food labels. I still remember spending a weekend in the grocery stores looking to see what colors worked best in the refrigerator sections of the grocery stores. But I still dreamed of, of writing. I still, that still nagged at me. And um, remember in the late 90s, there really wasn't any other way to publish except traditional publishing. And I remember somebody telling me that it was easier to win the lottery than it was to get published in fiction at that time. So after 116 rejections from literary agents 
for my first novel. I put that aside, wrote a second novel, found an agent, and my first book was published in 2000, A Perfect Evil. And that quickly became an international bestseller. And I quickly learned that in traditional publishing, it's almost as difficult to stay published as it is to get published. Mm -hmm. We're always... Um, it always seemed to be depending on the next contract and the next contract and having your publisher define what you were worth. And in the course of 16 books in 16 years, I went through nine editors, three big five publishers, and three agents. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I, I, I went through the merger of Penguin, Putnam, and Random House, and that's where I lost one of my editors who had just bought me just brought me over from Doubleday, and she was literally gone a week before my first book with her came out. So that was the second time that I had been orphaned at a publisher, and uh, the contract was had just started for three books. It was a major contract for $600,000 for three books, but that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, we always thought that meant, meant something, that they would take better care of you maybe. Finally, in 2016, at the end of that contract, my publisher said to me, well, we're going to have to pay you 20% less this time because paperback distribution just isn't what it used to be. That's in 2016, and I'm thinking, really? Paperback distribution suddenly isn't what it used to be. But the deal breaker for me was that they wouldn't drop the non-compete clause. So I couldn't even go write a, a book for someone else or indie pub anything to make up that loss income. So by by everybody's standards, they were offering me still decent money, but it, they wanted to split it in five payments, which made another difference. They held on to the non-compete clause. I just walked away. My literary agent thought that I was crazy, and I decided that I'm going to trust my readers to tell me what I'm worth. That was in 2016. I released my first indie book like nine months later, and I have never looked back. Mm. I love that because this is actually very common. Like you said, you've been doing this a long time, like 20 years, and it's not actually a surprise that you went through various mergers, you lost various editors and agents changed. And I mean, that's actually quite normal. Some people might think, oh, well, maybe there's something wrong with you that all of that <laughs> changed. But I mean... In reality, this is what happens, isn't it? When it's out of your control and it feels like you got sick of things being out of your control. It's becoming, I think it's becoming even worse now than it was then. And I remember when I was orphaned at Doubleday, my editor had had to retire. She had some health issues unexpectedly and they were not going to pick up my option at the end of the contract. And so when my I was writing my Maggie O'Dell series, my FBI profiler series, I was probably in book 10, 11, doing very, very well. And my agent's solution to me was, well, we'll go write a, a standalone. And I remember asking him, okay, and then what happens? And he said, well, we'll let the publisher decide. That did not play very well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's like, no. I mean, th this is what I see. And I, and I have friends who have been down the same route. You're absolutely right. It's not unusual. And their solution is to go write a standalone, go write a new series, because they don't want an old series if they don't have the backlist. So you'll see authors oftentimes in traditional publishing constantly reinventing themselves, constantly coming up with a new series to see if this one will click this time, and never having any control. And I, I tell authors now, the only person who is going to care about your career is not your editor, it's not your agent, it's you. And you have to take charge. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, they might care for the time that you are doing well. Uh, exactly. But even the most successful author can't stay at the top of the charts forever. And then it's someone else's turn. And that seems to be when things happen. I am interested, though, because I feel like the other thing that happens, I mean, I feel like this now after sort of 15 years as an indie, is a creative confidence and more of a self-confidence. So when you're a new author, you really just, you don't have that. You don't have the 
understanding of your craft you don't like you said I'll get my readers to decide it feels like you made mature creative decisions but I mean if people now are just starting out as new authors they don't have that creative confidence I guess so what would you say to them you know it's tough but again you do have control there are so many different things with social media that you can do to create a vibe to create an interest to bring readers directly to you. Remember, traditional publishing is always using somebody else to bring a reader to buy a book. That was another thing that that bothered me. I was not published for very long, and they were sending me to Ingram and to Baker and Taylor and to Barnes & Noble office to have lunch with people. And I, I remember saying to them, when do I get to meet readers Mm. And they actually kind of laughed at me, like, like how naive I am and said, well, these are the people that are going to sell your books and get your books to who needs to read them. So they don't have a connection to their readers. And that's probably the biggest disconnect that I see in traditional publishing that still exists. So as a new author, remember that you get to talk directly to them. And when you get one, when you get two, when you get three, start that newsletter, start that word of mouth, start building from just your readers that do come to you. That's the best way. And those, I have been very fortunate because I have readers that are still with me. And that's because I built that relationship despite my publisher not doing it. So indie authors have a very distinct opportunity, I think, to be able to do that and to go directly to the reader. And they have more opportunities to do that than ever before with social media. Mm. Yes. So, well, let's talk about this because I wanted to talk to you because you're doing some awesome things with your direct store. But just tell us a bit about how you do publish now. What is your publishing model? What is direct and what is wide? And why do you like having direct sales as part of the business model? Well, I like wide for the same reason that I like direct, because I I don't ever want to be, and I've heard you say this too, I don't ever want to be dependent on one source for my income, like I was with a publisher, someone who can like pull the rug out from under you at any one time. So I am wide everywhere on all of the e-retailers. I almost said that print is a little bit different, but more and more readers are buying online. So we have the advantage there as well. I'm a very slow writer. I mean, I was very much into the model of traditionally publishing one book a year, and that's what I do. So our, a launch for us is a big deal. We make probably a chunk of our money in the first month. A launch looks like we um, pre-order, we put up pre-orders, ebook and hardcover, still working with my narrator to hopefully someday get the audio at the same time, but he takes a little bit longer and that's okay. Um, So we have those two that are up for pre-order everywhere and our website. And we have our loyal readers used to coming and buying the hardcover on the web shop. And that's because they get a free bookmark. They get it personalized. They get it signed I wrap it in paw print tissue paper. I put a thank you card in. I make it special for them. But they're paying full price for that book, and they're paying for shipping. And sometimes we'll give them like a $2 discount or something like that. But it's not a lot. They come and they buy a premium product there. I want to give them the full treatment. So we do that, and we did a launch in December, and we did the most hardcovers that we've ever done. We we did, I think we're about 520 right now. Mm, wow. And that's, I think, might be the limit. <laughs> I mean, you, you just signed 500, right, for your Kickstarter. Yeah, but I don't personalize. Yes, yeah, or And package. I don't ship. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So you understand. You understand mm. how that works. So that's what we do. But people who, we had, we've been doing this for at least the last six, seven books. Put up the pre-order, things are going really, really well. Here's why you sell direct. Five days, literally five days before the book was to be released, the buy button on Amazon disappeared. Mm. A couple of hours later, the entire hardcover disappeared. 
And it was doing well. I mean, the ranking for the hardcover pre-orders was below 10,000 at one point. We normally sell 3,000 hardcovers in the first two weeks through Amazon, and it's gone. And nobody has an answer. And I don't know if you've, how, how hard anybody's tried to talk to anybody at Amazon or at Ingram Lightning Source, who prints our books and distributes it, but nobody would give us an answer as to what was going on. So we scrambled and we got an, out an email to our readers and said, hey, this is what's going on. I think we broke Amazon. <laughs> you know, I made fun, I <laughs> kind of made light of it. And I said, if you really want a jacketed hardcover, come to us. We'll make sure that you're going to get it. And we had a ton of orders and we're still fulfilling those now. But the other thing that, and, and I have to say, I don't do this alone. I don't know how you do it and how authors do it that are a one person shop. I, I respect the heck out of you guys. My life partner and my is my business partner. And Deb is an operations person. She's not an author. She was in the restaurant business for years before she came, before we got together. And she came up with the idea of, well, she went in hours, formatted the book for a hardcover at Amazon, which is case bound, not jacketed. But we got that up. So don't ever assume <laughs> that Amazon, and I've heard you say this before, that Amazon, Amazon's not going to change or Amazon's going to always be there. And that is the best reason for going wide. And it's the best reason for selling direct. Mm. Yes, I think it comes back to what we said earlier about your need for control after so long out of control and then Ab things still being out of control. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it just drives you crazy, doesn't it? It does. It's so funny. I mean, I, it's funny you say that I was on Audible earlier of doing something and I was like, where have these books gone? Because uh, I don't check these things all the time. And then I'm like, what? And then they've disappeared from my dashboard. I haven't fixed this yet. Oh. This is just something I noticed earlier. And I was like, Oh, it's so annoying when you have to go chase people who, as you said, it's going to be hard to get hold of. And these things happen. And of course, it is not easy to sell direct. As you said, your partner helps you. Uh, as I mentioned before, I, I have not as yet personalized books, but um, and I use Book Vault who do all my shipping. So when I did my signing, I went up to their factory, which is a few hours. It's like a day trip for me. And I, sure. obviously not everyone can do that. So I agree with you. It's quite hard to do yourself unless you are really organized and you get your process sorted. But I do want to ask you particularly about the other things. So I've talked a lot about books for selling direct, but you do other cool things. So you have, you mentioned there a free bookmark, but you also sent me this wonderful box of stuff. So maybe you could talk a bit about merchandise and some of the pros and cons of merchandise, because it just adds this whole another level. Absolutely. And I can't remember what I sent you, but I'll go through some stuff. I look at merchandising as another revenue stream. And because I only write one book a year, it's a way for me to still connect to my readers in between. I can email them and say, hey, the next book is coming out in six months, but we have this. Would you like it? And I think that Kickstarter has kind of shown that readers do like that extra stuff. They want the read. I don't know if you call it like maybe the reader experience. They want more. They want to be a part of something. Books have such a skinny margin. I mean, they, the par profit margin for books, whether it's ebook or print books, even if you're selling print books directly, the profit margin is still pretty skinny. With merchandise, if you do it correctly and you really cost out what you need, you can make some pretty decent money. We've chosen quite a few different variety of stuff. And I should say, the way that this got started of us doing merchandising, when I left traditional publishing, I didn't want to do book tours anymore. I didn't want to travel. I loved meeting the readers, but you know how exhausting it is to oh, do yeah. the, the travel. Mm. You spend more time in airports than you do meeting readers. And, and Deb said to me, well, what about if we bring the readers to you? I so, said, yeah, right. Like they're going to want to come to Omaha, Nebraska. The first year we did it, we had 175 readers that came from, wow. 14, <laughs> yeah, from 14 states. <gasps> 
from wow. coast to coast, it was incredible. The second year that we did it, we had over 200. And the third year, we had to cancel because of COVID. Or maybe it was the fourth year. But when we did the tickets, I told Deb, well, I want to be able to price the tickets and we priced them so that we didn't make any profit. It was just the lunch. And then I wanted to buy them swag that they could take home. So that was a really good test market for what readers liked. And we had leftovers. And the thing that that occurred to us, people came to the luncheon and they would get their swag and they would say, well, I want to buy an extra ceramic mug for my friend. Or can I buy three? Or can I buy this? Or can I buy this? And that's when we realized, oh, I think they want this stuff. Maybe we can sell it. So it, it, that's when we first started. And, um, but there's a lot of considerations that lessons learned. There's a lot of considerations that you want to put into before mm-hmm. you do an item. And you should only do, I, I would suggest starting with one item. You don't mm-hmm. want to do more than one. You should always think of it as your walking billboard. You want the reader to, to love it so much that they're going to show it off. They're not going to put it in a drawer. Don't ever do anything that they'll just put in a drawer. And sometimes I worry about that with bookmarks, too. They'll just put it in a book. But they're going to use that, probably, if they're a print reader. But it should be something that, I think, extends the reader experience. But then you have to really look at, okay, so here are some of... I want to make these as tangible of of advice as possible and kind of narrow it down to what you should and should not do because there's a lot of time involved. You want to choose carefully. Everybody loves ceramic mug, mugs, but they are a lot of work. They're breakable to mail, so you have to ship them very carefully. You have to wrap them. If, you're not, if you don't want all of that time invested, that's not a good item. T-shirts. People love T-shirts. I still have not been able to figure out a way to make T-shirts profitable because I am not going to warehouse different sizes. So I always discourage people from those two items. But here's the thing. You can limit how many you sell, just like on Kickstarter. You can tell the readers that when they're gone, so you're not going to have a whole room full of whatever it is that you do. You can take pre-orders so that you know exactly how many, and you can limit the time frame that you're selling it so that you're not shipping and wrapping tote bags all year round. Some of the items that we did that were really successful, of course, is a book bag, a tote bag. And ours is pretty simple. I don't remember if I sent you one of those. Yes, yeah, you did. Yeah, oh, okay. and it, it, just to just to say on that, um, it's so funny. I used to really hate the tote bags. Like, why are people always giving me tote bags? And now it's really funny because I think because we're in a more green environment where we're not really using plastic bags anymore. I feel like tote bags are actually more of a thing now. That's just me. But I use actually using them a lot more than plastic bags. So yeah, it's a good option. Well, I have a confession to make. I don't really use tote bags. I mean, I may use them when I travel a little bit, but I don't use them. But And that's the other thing, too, is that mm. you have to remember that this is what your readers want and what they want to use and maybe not what you want. That's hard because yeah. there are <laughs> items that I think, oh, I would never, ever. Like, like for instance, we did readers' socks. They're just a plain Yes, you sent me sock. the socks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and those were like a huge seller. I saw some on Etsy and people custom imprint stuff on there. And I got the idea to do the, on one, on one foot of the sole of the sock, it says, shh. And then on the other, it says, I'm reading Alex Cava. And I saw that somebody had done that. And I got in touch with the vendor and I said, hey, can you do 50 to 100 of these and what kind of a price would you give me for them? And so that's how that came about. And that was one of our best sellers. To give you some sense of, it costs, those socks cost us about 3 to $4. And we went on to sell them for like nine ninety nine to twelve ninety nine, mm-hmm. And they- Plus shipping when it's your own store. So everybody, just to remind everyone. Absolutely. And some people might want to include more if they want to do, if they want- like for handling for their own time. I'm pretty bad about that. Deb tells me I'm always too bad about that. (laughs) Yeah, I don't don't have all the time. Yes, I do have the time. These are my readers. But even the ceramic mug, we bought those at 4imprint.com. And it's the number 4, I-M-P-R-I-N-T.com. They have lots of different items. And you can buy different amounts as well. We bought a nice ceramic mug. I think it's a 14-ounce mug. And 
we put on it. I stayed up all night with Alex Cava. Readers loved those. Mm. And we bought them for like five to six dollars. And I think we sold them for anywhere from fifteen ninety nine to twenty dollars. And then they had to pay for shipping. And the price never includes shipping. That's always extra. Those were a big hit, but I will warn people, those are tough to to wrap, tough to package, and they do take some time. And mm. I want to tell people too that Uline.com, U-L-I-N-E, is a great place to get supplies. You can get any color tissue wrap that you want. If you want to, if you're writing romance and you want pink, everything to wrap in pink, they've got it. If you want black, they've got it. What about your? Uh, you mentioned it, and it's lovely. The dog paw print wrap is that custom, or do you just buy that? Actually, that's right at uline.com, and they have hearts. They have a whole bunch of different tissue paper. I buy it. Uh, I think it's by 240 sheets for, I can't remember how much it costs. It's pennies on the, on the sheet by the time that you figure it out. Deb is my cost analysis person. And, and <laughs> I, I she, think she will is... tell me no more something else. Yeah, no more of this. Well, it's so funny because I think you're you're right. You have to source cheaper things. And I'm actually I'm going to the London Stationery Show later this year. <laughs> Oh. For exactly this reason, it's like a trade show for yes. paper people here in the UK. I mean, this is the other thing. I think another thing for the direct sales for me is trying to talk about the products themselves. So if you do source from, you're in the US, so a US source, or I'm in the UK and I'm going to be like, this is UK made, or this is a UK Etsy seller, or this kind of thing. Like Book Vault, my printer is here in the UK and I know them. And it's so I try and make it very personal because of the relationship. And I, I also wanted to mention, you've got a sticker that says who rescued who, and it goes with the dog paw prints. And I I think that is amazing. So can you talk about the emotional side of some of your merchandise? Because I feel like if someone is a dog person, they're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And I don't think that we do enough dog related stuff, but it is another way to brand because my series that I'm currently writing is a canine handler and people do love dogs or they love their pets. And that's another way to connect to readers. And just adding little bitty things like that, like my thank you card is a card of one of my dogs that has since passed. But the Jack Russell Terrier, we just rescued a Jack Russell Terrier. So now I'm using her on everything because my character in the Creed series actually uses a Jack Russell. But you do have to kind of connect to them on a level of what, whether it's dogs or whether it's the crime stuff. And we haven't talked about the crime scene scarf. Oh, yes. That, yes. That this is amazing. The big, that, was the biggest, <laughs> that was the biggest investment that we made. And I, I actually found this company that usually does sporting organizations and colleges and imprints really high quality scarves, knit scarves. I can, I can tell you that that's probably the first crime scene scarf they've ever done in their lives. But I, because I was going to buy 200 of them, I got them for like $8 a piece. And the market value I had seen was anywhere from $39.99 to $50 for that scarf. And we sold them for $29.99. And we made $4,000 profit just on that one item. Wow. But it, it's an investment. And that was easy to ship because it's light. You can put it in an envelope. You don't have to put it in a box. Um, and so it won't get damaged. Yeah. And it won't get damaged. Very good point. Exactly. Hmm. Well, let's talk about bookmarks because, <laughs> I mean, you do the free one, which is the like a card. And then you have this metal one. And I just have these serious doubts over bookmarks because personally I people give them to me in swag things and I just throw them out because I turn the corners of pages I'm a terrible <laughs> reader and, and so I wondered maybe just talk about bookmarks and the various things you do and uh, what you recommend the people who order a hardcover at launch from my web shop get a free bookmark um, and I had been making these ribbon bookmarks with a little charm at the end. Sometimes it was a paw print. Sometimes it was a little gun. Sometimes the crime scene ribbon was said crime scene. And I loved to do that. In my spare time, it was kind of a neat hobby to do. But then I would get behind, and we would have 300 to make. And it was, it was incredibly labor-intensive at that point and incredibly stressful. So I was looking at different avenues, and I wanted to make it special. And we found... 
I found this company that's called Metal Business Cards. And they're here in the United States, and they actually make bookmarks, too. They engrave them, they print them, and they cut out things out of the metal. And the metal is just very, very thin. Mm -hmm. It's probably the thickness of a cardboard bookmark. And we had paw prints up the side of it that went from bottom to top, and then we did Team Grace, and it was etched on one side and printed on the other side. And, of course, my, my website always include my website. But I ended up ordering those. Those were our giveaway this year. And they were $1.65. And that's what I considered my discount for them. That's their gift if they order from the website. But remember, they're paying a premium price for that book by coming to me. They're paying for shipping. And that's my gift to them. So I think that, again, it's it's a reader who probably is going to use bookmarks. Now, we're going to put some up on the website and see if they sell, and I'll let you know Yeah, <laughs> if, other, if other people It's hard, want them. isn't it? It's really hard because I feel like, as you said before, we are not our customers, and there are people who do use bookmarks. They don't want to damage the book, whereas I go at it with a, a biro page turning. That's what I do. But it's, yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I'm i looking at Book Vault who print my books. They're also looking at incorporating some form of merchandising as well. So that would also become almost print on demand. And But they don't do it yet. And one of the questions that and one of the doubts I, I have is the quality of the merchandise. So how... I guess, obviously, you've tested all of yours. But if we do print-on-demand things, it's very hard to know the quality of stuff that goes out there. So any thoughts on quality or places to particularly keep in mind or, or good places? Well, if it is a good place, they should be able to send you a sample of that. Maybe it's not with your custom imprint on it yet, but when anything that I do at for imprint. I make sure that they send me a sample because I want to make sure that the quality is... It's hard to look at a photo and know what the quality is. I want to feel it. And I think that that's very important. I, that's why I don't use Cafe Press. I know a mm-hmm. lot of authors use Cafe Press, and I don't want to use them because I, I want to be able to see the item. I want to see it go out. I want to see that it's wrapped in a certain way. But see, I'm kind of anal retentive about those kinds of things. <laughs> but I think if it's, a, if it's a quality item, they will send you a sample and you can, you know, kind of play with it and see whether you like it or not. I would definitely say you need to see it before you get, any, get your stuff even printed on it. Mm. I did have more of a slightly technical question because, as you said, you personalise books. And on your store, you can click to choose the hardback book. And then you can say, is it a a gift? And people type their name and they can tell you what they want written in it, which is kind of amazing. Uh, So how do you do that? Are those just extra like custom fields on Shopify? Or what are you using technically for your site? We actually use WooCommerce because we... Our website is about 10 years old, and uh, Deb uses different plugins to add things like that. And she prints it out for me, and I actually write it. I mean, that's as simple as it is. They put what they want, and I do each one. We we had, maybe because it was a, a December launch, we had probably the most people buying gifts for other books and wanting them personalized to them with special things like Merry Christmas or Hope You Love This or whatever it is. And I usually, for every book, I usually have a saying or something that I put in the book too. So I'll personalize it with their name if they want that. Put my little my little thing this year because it was Midnight Creed, I said, um, get ready for what happens after midnight. And I sign it. Some collectors just want a signature and they want a date. But when she hands me the packing slip, it has all that information. And I do it as custom as I possibly can, Mm. the way that they want it. And it takes an incredible amount of time, but I get into a flow. I've got my ear pods on. I'm listening to stuff. Usually I'm listening to you (laughs) uh, or one of the others, either uh, Sasha or some of the others. It's a time consuming. And I was trying to figure out how you could do this without actually signing each book. Uh, book plates are the only thing that I can think of is where you 
Uh, might well, be it's, able to... uh, there is a thing, and it's called tippins. So you you get sent the pages, and you sign them, and then the printer binds them in the thing. Oh, in how the cool book. is that? That's cool. Yeah, but it obviously because it's a difficult process. And it, you know, would have to be done in batches. It's more of a print run thing. So oh. I think this is what's interesting. And for people listening, if you haven't even dipped your toe in, you can just do ebooks with Book Funnel. You can do just print on demand. You don't have to do any of what we're talking about. But I think what we, where we are, is that that next step, or where you are. I'm slightly different to you in that I do not want to do this manual packing, and I don't have a deb. <laughs> <laughs> exactly 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 so and that's me, what i tell is, people too yeah but and, and I, I also like, only mm. i also only do it maybe once a year maybe yes twice that's a year. the important thing yes this is not something that we do all the time in fact the store was completely closed we put a banner up we will not be open until after january 4th and that's the thing that you need to remember if you do any of this stuff you get to control exactly what you want to do if you just want to do one item to your to your readers who love you and you only want to send out 50 of them or whatever, you get to control that. You don't have to do it to any large extent at all. Think of it as a Kickstarter that's out of your web shop. That's what I tell people. Yes. You've given me some good tips here. You just said you can close the store. I had literally not even considered that that would be an option. So I've been trying to figure out how we could go on some of our more adventurous holidays where we are pretty much off grid and I might check my phone like once while I'm away. And in the past, I've had a virtual assistant and all this. And there there are things I have to do even just for the digital stuff every day and questions and stuff like that. And I was like, and now you said, just close the store. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, people are really very understanding about that. Yeah. If you put up a banner and say, and they want to know when you're going to be back, they're very understanding about that. You just treat it like a storefront. No, you're not yes. going to be there. It's actually even more human. And this is another thing. We are being humans. And in fact, one of the benefits, I think, is if people email me and they say, oh, hey, how do I download my ebook? And then I email them and I can have a, a chat. And they're like, oh, you're a real person. You're not like an Amazon. <laughs> they, their tone completely changes when they realize that you're a real human. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I do take that to heart. You say that about AI, that we're going to mm. have to you know, be more human. And But I think that in order to have have a successful writing career in this day and age and in this atmosphere, I think you do need to double down on being human and that's going to help. Yes. And the other thing you said that was really useful is you said you can limit the time frame of a product. And again, I had I, whenever I think about books and things, I always just try and think about evergreen. But you're right. If you're doing like a Kickstarter idea just through your store, you can say, look, I've got this, I've got these 200 mugs or the 200 socks or whatever. And I'm going to, it's only open for a week or whatever it is. And then they're gone. And I, so I like that idea as well. So these are all good options for people. It's, it, and I think this is the other funny thing. There are more and more and more options every week right now, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can do it just for even one book. We did a special mug. I, one of my writer creeds happened during a, a tornado outbreak. And we did a mug that said, be stronger than the storm. And it, we said, it's only going to be available for launch date. It's only going to be available for this book. And when they're gone, they're gone. And we don't, we don't care anymore. I've, I've got, I'm looking at one now that I have that I've used for my tea, but it's, it's old and coming apart now. But you can decide to do whatever you want to do. And it, just look at it as, as, I look at it as an extension of the reader experience and a way to keep in touch with my readers. And what kind of a reward of what I can give them too. I don't want to milk them for a whole lot of money, but some of these items are things that they want. And they, they like to have that connection to the reader. That's the way that I look at it. Mm, and also that it, this is kind of a creative challenge and that it can actually be really fun. Like you said that you don't want things people can put in a drawer, but I really want to do a Memento Mori coin mm. with a skull on, you know, like remember you will die. And for some people that's super depressing. For me, it's part of my JF Penn brand really. And <laughs> I, I would like to carry one myself. And I know this is something that other people have done who come from that kind of stoic philosophy. So I was like, okay, so if I want a really good quality coin then I need to research 
where I could find that. I need to get it designed. I need to think about how I could do that. And so it, to me, it's almost like quite fun to think about the different things we can do. It absolutely can be. And the ideas are limitless, especially if you're trying to connect them to your books, your brand. It's, it is fun. It does stretch the creativity a little bit. Mm. So then one thing people always ask, of course, is, okay, so you put up your WooCommerce store or you put up your Shopify store or whatever, but then what happens? Like no one's going to come. So how do you get people to buy direct from you? What is your marketing strategy to your direct store? Newsletter is still the best. That's what, that's what I've found. The other thing too is that when you send anything out by box or even if you sell an e ebook from your website, you always send them a coupon to come back. A, a box, that's our motto in this house, a box does not leave this house without having an invitation to come back inside of it. And that's usually a sort of a $2 off your come back to the website and buy this. And a lot of times people will give those to somebody that they know. That's fine. We have different promotion codes that we use. And sometimes I guess we track them and see where they came from. We've tried other things. We've tried Facebook a little bit. We have a private Facebook page that we've built up. I think we've built it up to just under 2,000. Those are people who really want to be there. And so we will market to them as well. We're trying to get them trained now to come and get uh, buy ebooks directly. They're already trained to come and buy print books, but we really want them to come and buy ebooks. And we've we got quite a few to do that this time by giving them access early. Mm -hmm. They could download yes. the book, and um, they loved that. They by the time the book was on Amazon, they were going and putting up reviews. I love that. <laughs> So you look for different ways to give your base readers incentives, the readers that love you anyway. Uh, and, you know, they'll, they'll keep coming back. They'll keep telling people it's a struggle. It's a struggle. But I don't hold back in saying I make more money if you come to my web shop. I don't hold back. And they like supporting. They like supporting me. It's kind of like why people come to Kickstarters. They like being able to support the creator and being a part of that. Uh, but it is a struggle. I do have to admit, we're all constantly looking at different ways. And I think one of the things that has helped us the most is that coupon, that anytime that somebody does buy something, bam, they get an email or they've got it in, their, in the physical mail that you come back and get $2 off or $3 off of anything that you want to buy on the web shop. Mm. Well, you mentioned there that your email newsletter is the biggest driver of this so how are you building that email newsletter With this this last year we actually used book sweeps we've built that way a little bit i don't know if those people stay um we on that facebook page we've been really pushing for people to come be a vir club member we call them vir club members a very important reader and I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we do, like aggressively. I think those are really the only things that we've done this past year. Do you do free books at all? Oh, yes, I just did that. Actually, I just did my first free book this last December for this launch. And I believe that it's like a sample, okay? You do have to give samples to people that read. But doing free is still hard. It's just 99 cents I can understand. At least you're paying something for that book. But we did one and in I think it's only been four weeks and we've had over 50,000 downloads. And I keep telling myself that didn't cost me anything. These are readers who have never read me before and hopefully they're going to come and try the rest of the series. And here's the thing, the biggest struggle. I mean, first time authors always have a struggle. But when I left my publisher, I had three books in the Writer Creed series with Putnam. I didn't get those back. And I still love this character enough that I wanted to continue with him. So I have five books now of my own. But I don't have that first book. Ooh, so Ooh I've that's never painful. Been, it's very <laughs> painful. So you know what I did? This time I did my first one, which is the fourth book in the series, for free. And I, I wanted to see how that would work. 
and I'll let you know how it works. So far, it <laughs> seems like it's because we've then we put the second one for a dollar ninety nine, and we did the other two for four ninety nine, and then of course we had the new launch, and people were still going back and buying the nine ninety nine from Putnam for the first three. It's not something that I haven't heard anybody else talk about, but you do what you have to do. You have to be flexible. You have to come up with new and different ways. I probably will never get those books back because they haven't earned out. I was paid too much for them. But it sure makes it hard. <laughs> it sure makes it hard. <laughs> yeah, that is tough. But just a thought on that. Brandon Sanderson, obviously his first, first Kickstarter, which was like a six million, was a 10th anniversary special edi- special leather bound edition. And he licenses pretty much all his rights except for special editions. So mm. did your contract include special editions? You know, that's that I will have to go and see. That's a good point. I will have to go and see. Contracts are so awful right now. And mine wasn't quite there. That's a very good point. I do own the print rights to my very first Maggie O'Dell in my profile profiler series. And let's see, it was published in 2000. That might be a good idea to do a special edition for that series for the 25th anniversary. You're giving me a good idea here. There there we go. We're making you some money. (laughs) Yeah, that would be awesome because everybody still loves that series too. Okay. Yeah, well, that they, and there's a good tip for people who have come out of traditional publishing or maybe want to, which is look at your contracts and it may be that something's forgotten or it may be something, sometimes they say they want this, this, this and this and then all other rights remain with the author. That's sometimes a clause that is sits there. Obviously, if they've taken all formats for the life of copyright, all languages, yes, whatever, yes. then that's Oof. tough. But Brandon actually said, uh, I shared it just before Christmas, he did this sort of publishing, it was actually called Publishing Doom and Gloom. But one of the things that I took it the other way, which was kind of indie publishing positivity. And what he said was, the way that authors will make money over the next decade or whatever is by doing special editions direct. Ah. So, And then they'll just do the rest of it as a sort of, you know, not too much money, but they will do these special editions and people will pay for them. They don't have to be leather bound, but like we're talking about all these special ways we can do, you know, the gold foil I just did and the the ribbon and the color photos. And so I think I'm glad you've uh, you've given me some ideas. I've given you some ideas. Absolutely. That's great. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go and investigate that for sure. And, And by the way, I love that gold foil and the ribbon is so cool. It is cool, isn't it? And I think their Book Vault are getting some other machines. So I'm going to have Alex from Book Vault on the show coming up and talking about what is going to be possible with these short print runs or even print on demand. So (laughs) it's very exciting. You you know, what's really hard for me to believe, though, Joe, is that Mm -hmm. an author who does such a beautiful book with foil and a ribbon turns down the pages. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because the books that I buy as beautiful books, I don't turn down okay. the pages. Okay. But most of my, like, I've just got a pile on my desk as book research for the next novel. And, you know, I, I, what I do, I don't know if you do this, but for every book, I read all these books for research. And once I finish the book, I package them all up and I take them off to the recycling center or the or charity shop or whatever. And I remove all the books that are research for the last book and to make room for the next one. (laughs) That's smart, but that would drive me crazy because sometimes I want to know what, I mean, mine overlap. I want to know what was in the last one. Or I have a hard time getting rid of books. I really do. (laughs) Oh, I just have to make room for more books. (laughs) Well, and I don't have a problem with that. I'll just have a new stack. I'll build a new bookcase. It it is awful. Well, I think you will have bigger houses in America. Well, not all of you, but a lot of people. (laughs) True, true. Very true. true. Right. Well, we're out of time. So where can people find you and your books and your shop online? Well, they can they can find me at all the retailers. Um, they can find my shop at www.alexcava.com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Alex. That was great. Oh, thank you. I, and thanks again for inviting me. This was so much fun. So I hope you found this interview interesting. And if you're traditionally published, perhaps you might examine your contracts to see what you haven't licensed. And if you're indie and you're excited by some of the possibilities of selling direct, then maybe you can look into the merchandising area as well. 
Let me know what you think. You can leave a message on the show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel, or you can email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. Coming up later this week, I have a wonderfully down-to-earth interview with James from Go On Write about his creative book cover design process with Midjourney. He is literally the opposite of hype or fear. So it is well worth a listen. He's possibly the most down-to-earth person I've ever had on the show. (laughs) You will definitely enjoy our chat. It's super relaxed. Then in the normal show next week, I have an interview on how to be successful on Kickstarter with Paddy Finn, which I'm excited to share as you know how much I think Kickstarter and Selling Direct is so important for our future as independent authors. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.